the verse that really resonates with not just with me but with our times right now is when Miss Baker sa- talks about the injustice not only of the killing of of black people but that it seems that the death of black people is less important to society than the killing of white people so the the words which are based on a famous speech of Miss Baker's are untilling until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. And that part of the song, I think, really resonates with our current moment where those who are involved with Black Lives Matter and the broader movement for black lives are really just trying to underscore this point. Hello and welcome to Can I Get a Witness, the podcast. This podcast is an audio companion to the book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice. I'm Shay Tuttle. In each episode of this podcast, I'll talk with one of our authors about the person they profiled for the book and about their writing process. Today I'm speaking with Nicole M. Flores. Nicole is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. She is a contributing author at America, the Jesuit Review of Faith and Culture, and has published essays in the Journal of Religious Ethics and the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. For our book, Nicole wrote on Ella Baker. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I'm excited to talk with you today about about Ella Baker. Yes, I'm so excited to have a conversation with you. So can you start by um, giving a summary of Miss Baker's significance, especially for people who might not know who she is? Oh, well, uh, Ella Baker, as I've written in this, uh, this essay, was this magisterial or teaching authority and really moral authority, maybe even the moral heart of the civil rights movement. Now, so many people think of when they think of the civil rights movement, they think of Martin Luther King Jr. Rightly so, his role is tremendous. The uh, rhetorical power that that he lent to the movements, the work that he did, of course, so crucial. But Ella Baker was able to energize and really nourish the movements in ways that King never did, and really in in ways that were unparalleled by any other member of the movement. Not so much because she was, you know, this big time individual kind of at the front of crowds, but because she was a quiet leader, she was able to really build relationships with people. And that was her emphasis, was building relationships with everyone she she was able to meet and really getting to know people's stories, getting to know them on a personal level and using that as a way of both becoming familiar with who was involved with the movement, but also really empowering individuals, especially students. And that was where her heart was, was with helping and giving all the assistance that she possibly could to the students in their organizing efforts during the movement. So that's in a, in a nutshell who she was. But of course, her story is so much more complex than just these, just her role with, within the movement. Sure. Yeah. So Bernice Johnson Reagan, founder of Sweet Honey in the Rock, wrote a song based on some of Ella Baker's words. Could you tell us a little bit about the song, and then also about its significance in your own life? Yes. So the song, uh, as as you mentioned, is based on some of Miss Baker's most significant public speeches and some of the, the words that she 
uh, shared with others that really resonated. And the way the song is organized, it ends up highlighting some of the key themes of Miss Baker's mission. So it there's a verse that talks about the importance of empowering young people. She's, uh, the song says, to me, young people come first. Uh, there's another verse that speaks about empowering women. And she says, I'm a woman who speaks with a voice and I must be heard. So, so these, these verses each have a theme that helps to, uh, to illuminate what Miss Baker's life and mission was really about. But the, the verse that really resonates with, not just with me, but with our times right now is when Miss Baker talks about the injustice, not only of the killing of, of Black people, but that it seems that the death of Black people is less important to society than the killing of white people. So the the words which are based on a famous speech of Miss Baker's are until in, until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mothers' sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. And that part of the song, I think, really resonates with our current moment where those who are involved with Black Lives Matter and the broader movement for Black Lives are really just trying to underscore this point. And there's been so much controversy over uh, what this phrase, Black Lives Matter, really means. But Ms. Baker's words just make it so clear that it's not about saying that bl- Black Lives Matter more or Black Lives are are more important than, than anyone. It's saying that black lives do matter. It's, Mm -hmm. it's underscoring that point. So, so that's a really crucial piece of the song that, that I think sometimes even gets lost when it has been used in various uh, social justice movements. You know, some of the other verses are lifted up, but I think that's the real heart of the song is the reminder and the, really the exhortation that black lives matter. Uh, But you also asked about the the significance of the song to me. So once upon a time in divinity school, I was in an acapella group of all women and we were called the sacramental whiners. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sang, <laughs> I know it's, um, it's a funny name, <laughs> but um, we, in addition to singing just for, for fun and enjoyment, a part of our mission was to sing songs that really, highlighted the role of the relationship between justice and our faith and the the real need for social justice in our world and and our role as either future pastors or future theologians or future social activists in pursuing justice so so we would often sing this song as a way of of highlighting that, but concurrent to my participation in this acapella group, I was working at the time with the University of the Poor School of Theology and doing a summer internship with them, which took me all around the country to meet with with community grassroots community organizers from all over all over the country. So in Cleveland, I met with an organization of of workers who were deaf, who were uh, advocating for for rights, the economic and human rights of deaf people in the workplace and society, etc. I uh, traveled to to Immokalee, Florida, to work with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, who advocate for the rights of farm workers in the fields of Southwest Florida. And it seemed to me that that this song really captured something of the spirit of the, those movements. They weren't about, you know, standing up and making grand proclamations about justice all the time. You know, they, they did that. That was a part of the work. But the day in, day out heart of the work was really the building of relationships, the empowering of young people, empowering of women, uh, declaring, you know, the the significance of lives who had been disregarded 
by society, whether this was Black life or deaf life or the life the lives of those who are without housing or the lives of those who are without documentation and are being enslaved in in agricultural fields in the United States, you know, that that this was really the theme. And so these experiences together, both singing with this group of women committed to a radical vision of Christian uh, love and justice, and working with these groups kind of made the song my theme song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, So I'd love for you to talk a little more about, you've referred a couple of times to the, to the young, and in your chapter, you refer to, um, you, you refer to the preferential option for the poor and the young. Could you talk a little more about what you mean by that and um, about how you saw it play out in Ella Baker's life? Yes. So my own, I, I approach this, this work through the lens of a Catholic moral theologian and specifically a Latina Catholic moral theologian who I've spent a lot of time studying liberation theology and trying to practice it in so far as I can as someone living in very privileged environments as a tenure track professor <laughs> at the University of Virginia. But the preferential option for the poor is often emphasized as one of the key Um, if not the key thesis of liberation theology, that God lifts up the poor because they are, not, not because the poor are morally superior or are better or matter more than those who are not poor, but because they need God's help, because that's where God's love and God's spirit really, really is moving and working to create justice. And it's interesting in that the original documents referring to the preferential option for the poor also called it the preferential option for the poor and young. And the and young part gets kind of excised out. I don't know if it was for the sake of brevity originally or if people were just, you know, really attracted to that preferential option for the poor part, but it's technically the preferential option for the poor and the young. And that young part, I think, makes the the teaching even more radical. Uh, it, it says not only do we turn to those who and and, and prefer and in uh, and lift up those who are poor, but we look to those who we wouldn't give authority to within our society because we think that they they lack experience or they lack power or they lack resources. And it says where where those things are absent, we we give it to them, we empower them, we give them resources, we let their voices be heard. And that was really the heart of Ella Baker's public work and ministry was reaching young people and saying, first of all, that you have the power to, to act in these ways, but also speaking truth to those in power saying, it is your obligation as Christians to listen to the young, to listen to the poor and to the young. Uh, for, for that reason, she was considered a very special teacher among the students who were involved with the movement. They actually called her Fundi, which is Swahili for teacher. And that, that was one of her nicknames of honor, if you will, uh, was, was Fundi, uh, because she was seen as someone who was always trying to lift up that voice. So it, there's... um. There's a section of your chapter where you talk about an article uh, that Miss Baker co-wrote with Marvel Cook. Um, so could you start by talking a little bit about what the article was trying to expose, to call out? Yes. So Miss Baker had a really vibrant career in so many ways. But one thing that's interesting about her is that she she had a variety of different jobs. She didn't just have one career. She worked with the movement, but she also worked as a journalist for a time. And during this time, she and Marvel Cook were trying to bring light to the ways that Black women domestic workers were being abused within the markets in New York City. So they wrote this this expose, really, detailing the way that 
had been abused by those who were hiring them, such as uh, evaluating their bodies in ways that were very dehumanizing and very reminiscent of the treatment of Black women and Black people during slavery, if, you know, looking at their knees to see if they spent enough time on their knees scrubbing floors, for example, uh, was one, one way that, that their bodies were dehumanized. So Baker and Cook set out to expose that. But within the chapter, uh, one thing that I discovered in, in the research that I did on Miss Baker was that in that article, there are some, I, I suppose you can say, infelicitous phrasing that referred to some of the, the people who were doing the hiring of the Black women domestics as squatty Jewish housewives. And that terminology, uh, first of all, disturbs me as someone who thinks that any kind of derisive treatment of another person's religion or ethnicity is unacceptable. It, it really stood out to me and and into some of the, the uh, sources who I read for the chapter. And it, it stood out, especially coming from the lips of, of those who are committed to the freedom and dignity of all people. So it really caught my attention because in a certain way, it really highlights the humanity and the, and the way that we as humans can have we we all have these moments where we don't honor the dignity of people who we are in conversation with or people, especially those who are our enemies. And read within the context of Ella Baker's stunningly beautiful life of advocacy for justice and building relationships, I read it as a moment and as an invitation to to examine our own not only our own actions but our own words and our own thoughts and to always try to do better because of course if we think about our own whether it's our own words our own thoughts our own practices things that we that we might say within our private context our our, our smaller communities ways that racism or colorism or dislike for other uh, other people from other faiths that we I'm sure that each one of us as humans can identify moments where either we said something that was that we wish we wouldn't have said or didn't ref doesn't reflect our commitment to radical justice mm -hmm. or we we haven't spoke up when somebody else has said that uh, said something like that because we were fearful perhaps of the implications of of speaking up the the potential consequences all that said i see it as a moment in miss baker's life that that reveals to us that she was a human. She was an extraordinary human, but she was a human. And that all humans, all of us, have to continue to examine our own lives for ways that we can be even more committed to, to the dignity of all, even as we work against injustice. Because it's so it's so interesting to me that this happened within the context of of her her work against what was really slavery by another name that Black women domestics were experiencing in New York City. So what does it look like to fiercely, even ferociously, fight against injustice and fight against enslavement and fight for freedom and while doing it on terms and in terms that dignify the enemy? What does that look like for us today? And I think that's an important question. There's a there's a lot at stake in our both our political and religious discussions right now. That we have a contest of ideas, a contest of beliefs, and we need to we need to keep that in mind. That the the way that we fight matters. 
you know, there's a lot of fights going on right now and they're important ones. And uh, I think that a lot of people feel like their humanity is on the line in our present moment in history. And I think she teaches us that it does matter how we treat the enemy and that true freedom comes when we are all treated as fully human and in accord with our dignity. And that doesn't come easy. That doesn't, that's not simple, but it calls upon the best of us. And for Miss Baker, it called upon her faith. It called upon the reminder from her baptism that she had made a commitment to do better and to be better. And for her, that was a, a cornerstone of her, her faith that she took her baptism seriously and that that call was to always do better and to be better. Mm -hmm. Could you tell the, the story briefly about her baptism? That's a lovely little part of your chapter. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very uh, simple story and very illustrative of Miss Baker's approach to her faith in general. No muss, no fuss. She just... She took her commitments seriously, and she was at a revival, and she and her brother decided, hey, let's get baptized. <laughs> Basically, there there wasn't really, you know, a big, perhaps, you know, Augustinian moment where she had a, a vision or heard a voice or, <laughs> or something like that. She just, they decided it was time, and they decided to do it together, and in that, in that decision even though it was made, you know, kind of in the spur of the moment and without much fanfare, she saw the baptism as making a commitment to a new life. And so the way she explained it was that even little habits about herself that she didn't really love, such as her temper, that the baptism was a commitment to try to be more Christ-like. So she wanted to work on her temper as a show of her her commitment to the promise that she made. And it's very, very interesting. So as, as a Catholic, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, debates out there over infant baptism, but we definitely baptize our infants <laughs> as, mm -hmm. as Catholics. But there's a way that her, her view on baptism highlights an important part of the theology of baptism that it's both gift. It's something that, that we receive. And that's why, why uh, Catholics and other uh, Christian traditions do baptize infants. We say, this is a gift coming from God. It's a sacrament. It's something that, that we receive. But then she says on the other side of that, that it's also a promise and it's a commitment. It's a promise. If we've made it, you know, when we're a little bit older, like she was, I was personally, I was 11 years old when I was baptized. You know, we make this promise to try to be better. Uh, but if we're baptizing a little person too, we're making a commitment to try to help them to be, to be better too. And yeah, I just think that she really, she really understood what that sacrament was all about and, and kind of gives us all a little bit of a, a theology check to say, <laughs> you know, it is both gift and it is promise at the same time. Yeah. Could you read that excerpt about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party convention? Despite her preference for a quiet life, Baker often found herself on the front lines of intense public conflicts, putting to use the rhetorical prowess she demonstrated as a student. The story of her advocacy for racial justice at the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or MFDP, state convention reveals her unique capacity to speak truth to power. Formed in opposition to the Mississippi Democratic Party, which only allowed for participation by whites, the MFDP opposed polling taxes, literacy tests, and other unjust barriers to Black enfranchisement. Yet, while the MFDP aimed to challenge the Democratic establishment, their convention was not free from racial conflict. Baker observed that Black lives were still valued less than white ones, 
as evidenced by scant attention given to the slaughter of Black people relative to the deaths of white civil rights workers. According to Bernice Johnson Regan, Baker was dismayed by this blatant disrespect for God-given dignity. She was talking about the civil rights movement workers who had been murdered in Mississippi in 1964. And as they searched for the bodies of the three missing workers, they turned up bodies of black men in the rivers of Mississippi that nobody had searched for because they were black and they did not get killed with white men. She was angry about that. Speaking immediately before Baker at the convention, the party's lawyer had belittled the Black Conference attendees by referring to them as you people. This common but insulting phrase impelled Baker to rebuke his language. With the bodies of Black men lying on the bottom of a river on her mind, Baker proclaimed to the delegates what was at stake in their struggle. Until the killing of black mothers' sons becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mothers' sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Those gathered at the convention responded to her words with shouts of freedom, freedom. Thank you. The line that you referenced before talking about Ella Baker's or Ella's song about until the killing of black mother's sons becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. As you mentioned before, it's impossible to hear that line without thinking of Black Lives Matter. And you talked some before about the connection between what Ella Baker was working for and the aims now of Black Lives Matter. I'm wondering whether Ella Baker has been a resource or an inspiration for the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, certainly it's clear that that's it's that it's in the same tradition, but has there been a kind of conscious use of Ella Baker? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, her voice and presence is discernible in various elements of the movement, but of course the movement is uh, quite grassroots. So it, you know, it doesn't have a centralized authority that's kind of, you know, saying, oh, and our reading for today is Miss Baker's. Although that, you know, there are, you know, really awesome resources out there, you know, both community resources and intellectual or academic resources that emanate from the movement. But I, I was really caught by an image that I saw of Trayvon Martin, it was a, it was a drawn image, and it was the, the iconic picture of Trayvon wearing his hoodie, and it had been reimagined and kind of redrawn with Ella Baker's words, kind of making up the parts of the image, and that to me really shows the resonance and the continued significance mm. of her words for the movement, that they are really inspiring those who are on the ground doing the organizing, the work, the protesting, but also that that, that the words are, are what theologian David Tracy would call a classic, where they have meaning in their own context, but their meaning overflows. They have an overflowing or an abundance of meaning, and that what she was saying remains true, and it will remain true, that we, we cannot make the unjust treatment of Black women and men just go away from our history. And I think one mistake of responses to to racism is to say well things are different now therefore and uh, forget that this this history exists and that will have to be a part of how we think about race and race relations both now and and moving forward that that it would be a mistake to to forget that what we see with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, we've seen before, and we'd seen before that, and we'd seen before that, and that that those patterns and that the persistence of the disvalue placed on Black life 
that that is something that we're going to have to continue to to reckon with. And I, I think that for the that reason, those words really still resonate. Uh, but also with her, I think there's a resonance between Miss Baker's model of leadership and what I see from organizers within the movement, that there is a, an attention to relationship and to taking actions and to taking prophetic actions. You know, Ella Baker, she was a really, I think she preferred a, a quiet kind of existence, but she often found herself right in the heat of the action uh, because she had a keen sense that there were some moments where even if one was quiet, one could not be quiet in those moments, even if one, you know, would prefer to, to, to not speak up, that, that those were precisely the moments in which you should speak up. So some of her, her legacy is that of a leader who stood up and walked out, out of the, the convention when she saw that young people were being disregarded, or who stood up and said, Black, Black Lives Matter, and that's the that that freedom is not possible until we acknowledge that basic truth that black lives matter as much as white lives and so i see her spirit very much alive within uh within the movements as as it has been present over the past i guess more than half decade now mm -hmm. how do you think you have been changed by spending so much time with Ella Baker? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that one challenge that Miss Baker has given to me has been the invitation to be a quiet leader, a quiet but powerful leader. I think that when I began my own work, both in theology but also in social activism, I kind of envisioned the, the optimal leader as being one who stood in front of the crowd and had the loudest voice. Or, you know, if you think of social media, the person with the hot take or the, you know, the Insta game that was, you know, totally uh, <laughs> on point all the time. And yeah. I, I think I realized through the time that I've spent reflecting on her life and her work and really her person, I just so admire her character, that she really pursued quiet character over clamorous celebrity. And that, that the kind of leadership that will really change minds and hearts, that will really help people to encounter new and better ideas and to see others as fully human, isn't necessarily the pastor standing in front of throngs of people on the National Mall, that it could be me too working in my little tiny office, you know, writing every day, meeting with students, going to church meetings in my free time, you know, being kind of socially awkward, both in person and on social media, that, that there's a place, <laughs> there, there's a place for me in this movement. And not just for me as Nicole, but for everyone. So every student I encounter, every person, every parishioner I meet at church, every congregant I meet at church, that there's a place for that person and for her, or his leadership in the movement. And for me, that's been really powerful and a way of reframing how I see my work. I think that there is a lot of pressure for, for those who want to be voices for change, to be the loudest voice for change. But she she shows us that that's not necessary or even the most effective way to go about it. Be the person who makes the relationship, who takes the time to get to know the story of the other person, who goes out of her or his way to, to support young people, to support women, to support movements for, the, for recognizing the dignity of Black people mm -hmm. uh, and, and people who have been mistreated through, throughout human history that 
you know, that's where the power is. It has been really, really great to talk with you about Miss Baker. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Can I Get a Witness? The podcast is a production of the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia, a research initiative whose mission is to study the social consequences of theological ideas for the sake of a more just and compassionate world. To learn more about lived theology, visit livedtheology.org or find us on social media. This podcast is produced, edited, and engineered by Jessica Seibert and written, edited, and hosted by me, Shay Tuttle. Original music is by Drew Wilson. Special thanks to project director Charles Marsh. The book, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice is edited by Charles Marsh, Shay Tuttle, and Daniel P. Rhodes. It's published by Urban's Publishing Company and is available now. Thank you for listening to Can I Get a Witness? The podcast. <laughs>